It is lit. <laughs> okay, we're ready to go. Um, this one is a really quick, I'm hoping it's going to be quick anyway, live stream about the general and practical principles of physics paper, which is the LXL paper, but it's also really about just laws and principles in physics. Just a little heads up, if you're a GCSE and you're watching this, then obviously your paper two is on Friday, so I'll be doing some live streams for GCSE on Wednesday and Thursday nights. And I'll be doing OCR Gateway generally on Wednesday, but it'll be useful for everyone, I think. Um, and on Thursday, I'll do some AQA questions. Okay, so that should be really, really useful. I will be live on Wednesday night, ready for paper free um, for you A-level people as well. So just pay attention to whether that's a GCSE stream that you tune in for or an A-level stream. I'm not sure which way around they'll do, but I'll, I'll put that out there. I will uh, schedule them. Okay, um, today we're going to go through those laws of um, physics and the general kind of principles of physics that you're going to expect to come up in this paper free. The reason I've done this stream, okay, I wasn't actually planning on doing this one, is I asked after your paper two, I asked, well, um, how many of you, uh, what, what would you want me to cover the night before? And some people said, what's a law and what's a general principle of physics? So I figured I'd bit, pretty much better do a stream for you so you can have a little look at that. So I'm kind of setting you some homework tonight. If you're, um, if you're wondering what exactly um, a law of physics is, then I'm setting you some kind of homework tonight. Okay. Just before I get into that, um, I will stop and look at the chat as well, just as we go. Let me know that it's okay. Let me know that... Um, uh, Mariam's here, yeah. So <laughs> let me know that, um, that you can hear me loud and clear and everything, and I will be um, jumping into the chat at different portions of that. So this is Gorilla Physics, and I'm really hoping to get to 10k subscribers by February. That was my target in February. Okay, that would be four years old the channel by then, and I'd really like to get to 10k um, because then I get a community tab, and it's just going to make a lot of things easier for me in terms of um, using YouTube to get things out there and help more people so can you share things if you're eight if you're able and you're outgoing then can you tell your teachers can you tell your younger pupils friends whatever if you've got an opportunity to tell somebody about what is good about a level and i've helped you out then tell them just about my channel will you please there's also patreon as well which um you know i haven't got many and i'm not a big plug for that but what i'd like to do is use that as a community to um develop my channel in the future and that's really it okay like after um results day this year then a lot of you are going to think oh that's me done this gorilla physics is just for gcc and a-level physics but i want to develop the channel beyond that i want to make it kind of more interesting obviously still with a central theme around gcc and a-level physics so i want to start doing some things and one thing i'd like to do well i've got half a million subscribers i'd like to do an end of kind of exam season and half a million subscribers live stream and invite you to play hunt the teacher with me which uh, more, more of that will come out hunt the teacher sound like something you might might fancy um and also, I'm looking at maybe actually challenging myself to study more and bring, therefore, kind of better advice for people studying A-levels by doing some of that study myself, because it's been quite a while since I did my A-levels. And maybe by doing that, um, it, I'd be able to kind of experience a bit more what the A-levels are like now. Right, that's enough of me chatting. We're going to go into the visualizer next. Really glad you guys um, are all here. And I'm going to talk through those general and practical principles of physics that I've picked out for you. <laughs> Jump stair st scare still getting you guys. Okay, so these are the paper freeze that you guys have got um, next few days. It's not as good today, is it? But there we go. Um, these are the paper freeze that you guys have got. Edexcel is the one that I do, so this this will be most kind of applicable to Edexcel. But OCRA also the paper free is called a um, unified physics paper. Okay, so now I'm betting that, that generally means that it's got synoptic questions on it. Okay, so really this video is not just about laws and first principles, it's about synoptic questions. And I'm hoping that is not a brand new term for you in terms of understanding what and how you're going to be tested at A-level. Okay, um, OCRB is practical physics. Now, if you're OCRB um, or indeed if you're AQA, then you're probably going to want to go back into my... Um, into my practical video where I went through all the core practicals for Edexcel. Now, although they're Edexcel core practicals, they're still very relevant because the thing that is the same across all exam boards is the apparatus and techniques. So basically the things that you're going to say to improve those practicals, typically the hardest questions, are going to be the same for all exam boards. So if your paper free has practical things, then go back to my live stream about um, practical physics, okay? Because uh, it was a really, really useful. I felt like it was a really good one. If you were there for that one, then why why don't you just uh, tell everyone that was a really useful thing to go through, okay? Um, that I think that was a really good stream. Also, answering longer written questions 
was a really really good stream to go through as well so just if you're in the comments just set, tell other people if you found those things useful so they don't just take my word for it um, educas have light nuclei and options now I'm not going to go into lots of detail about any of the optional sections because well I don't teach them and I, I feel like I wouldn't be the best person to give you the best advice for them like just a, in a live stream like this okay maybe in the future but um, you're better off listening to people who are experiencing those syllabi to to give you the tips on those um, light however though I did go through in quite a lot of detail the history of the theory of light if that's useful for you in educas in the um, paper 2 live stream so definitely go through that right without further ado then laws and first principles. Well, let's define the two things first. A law is a um, is something which can be uh, found experimentally and happens every single time we find it experimentally, right? So it, it happens repeatedly. It's something which happens every single time we test it, we find the same relationship. That's a law. Um, first principle is something from which other physics kind of knowledge is derived. And that's really an important thing to say. So the, these are the kind of things, the laws and first principles in physics are the things that underpin everything that we do in, in physics, right? So um, here they are. Now, now the way I've done this, and I'd encourage you to do the same if you're not sure whether this absolutely applies to your spec, is I've just gone through the, the, the specifications there um, and I've found in the spec law and principle. And I've pulled out every single law and principle. Again, I'll tell you, I didn't go through all the options because I didn't think I'd be able to do them justice for you. Okay, I did pick out one or two things. And um, really, if you bear these in mind when you're in that paper free, either that kind of, um, either that, uh, you, you know, synoptic question, the written question, that you can, if you bear these in mind in those paper frees, then you're going to be able to solve the problem because they're going to, the questions are going to be around one or more of these laws or principles, right? So let's just whiz through them hopefully really quickly. So Newton 1 is that there needs to be a resultant force for there to be acceleration. So if there's no resultant force, then there is no acceleration. Newton 2 is good old F equals MA, or resultant force, importantly, is equal to mass times acceleration, and that also has the um, caveat delta P over T as well, change in momentum, a rate of change in momentum, change in momentum over time. Newton's third law is that the force from A to B is equal but opposite to the force from B to A. Importantly, these are acting on different bodies, so you're only going to have one force on an individual body, so therefore there can be acceleration. A lot of people confuse these two. In you know, Excel has not been a lot about Newton's laws, so that these might, might be one to look to look at. Principle of conservation of linear momentum is actually a consequence of Newton's third law, because if two bodies are exerting equal but opposite force on each other, then it must be the case that they have the same rate of change of momentum. So therefore they have an and a thing a stipulation of Newton's three is that they forces act for the same time, so they must have the same change in momentum. Okay, that's um, m1 u1 plus m2 u2 equals m1 v1 plus m2 v2. That will allow you to solve every single one of them. It does say print, uh, conservation of linear momentum, but that also applies in 2D, and it just means that the momentum is conserved in the x and conserved in the y. Principle of moments is sum of the anti-clockwise moments is equal to the sum of the clockwise moments, so a good one for solving problems. If you ever see anything the word pivot mentioned, that's what they're getting at probably, okay. Principle of conservation of energy is actually a consequence of the first law of thermodynamics, which we'll talk about in a moment, but um, is a huge and important one there. So you can't get something for nothing. You cannot create energy out of nowhere. Now, I hope I've got thermodynamics going here because I can't remember seeing one. I just had a little read through. Next ones, okay, so Ohm's law is, of course, an important law. That's just V equals IR. Now, here's one where I don't like the way it's kind of described in a lot of people's work because everything always obeys Ohm's law because it's a law. But they say, well, here's a graph where something obeys Ohm's law, and here's a graph where something doesn't. Now, that is not really the case, because you can use any point on this to, to find a resistance. You can use any point, any resistance at any point on this to find a current. So it is always the case that V equals IR. If something is ohmic, it just means it has a constant resistance. Okay, that's obviously uh, 1 over R, rather. Don't want to make another mistake like that, do we? Kirchhoff's laws. Now, actually, first law is the principle uh, is the um, currents law. The sum of the currents into a point equals the sum of the currents out of the point. 
and the second law, this is the first law for the currents, um, the second one is about the, the um, conservation of energy, right, which is the voltage law. So the second one is the voltage law, and that states that the sum of the rises of potential is equal to the sum of the falls of potential. So if you think about um, a cell gives something a rise in potential, and a resistor gives something a fall in potential. Okay, and this might be distance around a circuit, and these would be wires with negligible resistance. Okay, um, I hope that kind of makes sense there. And then why is it conservation of charge? That's the first law, that's the current law. Conservation of energy is this one here. And actually that leads into the principle of potential dividers because this supplied potential has been divided out between these two resistors here. So actually this principle of um, potential dividers is a consequence of Kirchhoff's energy law. Okay, um, Stokes law is um, the one with viscosity, it's the drag law basically. Um, Hooke's law, I uh, should write that out, should we? Uh, I don't want to check that I'm getting it right. As you should do, even when you know a law by heart, you get given the equations so blooming well use them. Okay, this is this one basically saying that this only applies in laminar flow, by the way. So um, that might come up in some specs, I'm not really sure if it does, okay. Uniform kind of object, spherical object in laminar flow is what we always talk about. Otherwise, this, stokes, this, this breaks down a little bit. And I think it gets proportional to R squared, the more kind of turbulent it goes. But anyway, um, Stokes law, drag force is equal to 6 pi eta, which is the viscosity, uh, radius of the sphere, and the velocity of the sphere. Okay, now they use this a lot to derive an equation for terminal velocity, and that was in paper two at Excel or without the um, upthrust. Uh, Hooke's law is F equals K delta X, okay? Um, and again, here's another one where we say it obeys Hooke's law for a while and then stops obeying it. Well, it does still obey it, it's just got a different K when it's up here. Okay, it's just got a different spring constant when it's up here. Archimedes' principle, often used with this, okay, is that the, the upthrust is equal to the weight of water displaced. Okay, uh, weight of the water displaced. Anyway, I'll just leave that at that. Um, quantum then is a huge big um, idea in physics. Okay, so if absolutely huge principle in physics so they might be testing you out on this one. Okay, it just quantum just means discrete energy level changes. always talk about those when you're asked a question about quant quantum okay so it's over increasing in uh, energy level change so, so in fermionic emission you have to give it a certain amount of heat energy to emit an electron photoelectric em um, effect okay or photoelectric emission if you like emitting a photoelectron would be enough light energy to emit a photon a, a discrete energy level change to emit the photon. And emission and absorption is talking about those photons. Okay, and when we go up the energy levels, we do it by absorbing a photon. And when we fall down the energy levels, we emit a photon. This is how light works, basically. And this is an important one for the principles of light, which is coming up in one of those uh, specs. Lenz's law, I don't know why I've done this wrong way around. Uh, Faraday's law states that the EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage. And Lenz's law just simply adds the minus. So these are really often coming up on these kind of general and practical principles of physics kind of questions, um, which is using this and making sure there's a significant direction somewhere in the question for you to make sure that you apply this minus or it's about the rate of change. So they've talked about maybe a higher frequency or they've talked about a higher speed. So you know the rate of change is higher. So therefore the EMF is higher. So look out for those things there. I think this is you know, one of those the, the kind of ways to go about those, que those questions is spot the law. If you get this, for homework, if you make sure that you understand all of these laws implicitly, then you can go ahead and make sure that you, um, you can go ahead and make sure that you are applying a relevant law to each question that comes up. Okay, and that's going to get you the gold. That's going to get you the exam gold, really. 
Okay, so the principle of superposition of waves is that basically if you've got one wave coming in one direction, let's say this is traveling in this direction, and another wave traveling in this direction, then they're going to superpose. Okay, so they might constructively interfere or destructively interfere depending on the phase difference. And they absolutely love this one superposition in this general and practical principles of physics one. Okay, because it's a really important uh, and it underpins a lot of physics, the idea of waves interfering. Huygens' construction is actually a use of that, and again, I talked about Huygens in the, I think, the paper two feed, where I was talking about the history of um, our ideas about light, wave or particle duality. Basically, wave particle duality is light, a wave or a particle, and I talk about Huygens' construction there. It basically talks about if we think about one wave front, we can also think about it as being a series of individual kind of um, points of emission of waves, and those individual points will all emit waves in semicircles, right? So there'll be this interference of these little semicircle circular waves, these little radial wave patterns, which we call wavelets, so that there is one wave front which appears to move progressively forward. So it unifies the idea that, that we see these kind of flat wave fronts with the kind of semicircular or circular ripples that we see when we drop um, stones into ponds. Snell's law is the refractive index is the sign of um, the angle in the first medium is equal to the refractive index sine of the angle in the second medium. Okay, that's just one of the equations that they're going to give you. But you need to make sure that you know how and when to use it all. Okay, it's this one here. Essentially, we, if the angle in the medium is the, um, sorry, the N1 refers to the medium which this angle one is in. Okay, so normally you see I and R, and that's absolutely fine. So if it's I, this is the first medium, this is the, the um, incident angle, this is the second medium, so this is the angle of refraction. Okay. Um, this is in particle physics, so it's more laws of conservation. Now, charge, baryon number, lepton number, mass number, energy, or oh, sorry, mass, energy, and momentum are always conserved. Now, I put strangeness in brackets because it does come up in some syllabuses but not others, and it's not conserved in weak interactions. Then, principles of ionization and deflection in detection of particles. So, how can we detect particles? We can only detect charged ones because they ionize. We cannot detect neutral particles. And we can understand and find out what their charge is by how they're deflected in mag fields. So, this is when your F equals BQV stuff comes in. Okay, and making that equal to mv squared over r. And this should help you understand what we're meaning by synopticity is when you're actually, or synoptic questions, you're actually using stuff from your fields and using stuff from your circular motion within a question. Okay, and that tends to be some of the hardest questions in A-level physics where you have to use uh, different things from different areas of the uh, syllabus. So essentially what you've got to do is just use these normally to find out whether um, a interaction could actually occur. And as I said, that you can only detect charged particles. How do you infer these uncharged particles are there? Then it's because of this momentum conservation. So there needs to have been something moving in a certain direction to allow momentum in 2D to be conserved. Mass and energy, well, this is equals mc squared in there. So it's a big old um, principle in physics. Okay, so they may well ask you something about that in this paper's coming up. All right, Stefan Boltzmann law, again, I did that in the last paper. That is essentially that. Uh, let's find it. So let's make mistakes. Luminosity is proportional to t to the fourth. Okay. Luminosity of a star is proportional to its temperature uh, to the power of four. Wien's law, which says that the maximum um, wavelength or the peak wavelength times by the temperature equals a constant, and yet given that constant in the um, in the what do you call it? Equation sheet. And again, I went through both of these in a previous life feed, so I'll do that. Newton's um, universal law of gravitation. Now, Newton found so much out about gravity, and this is what we say Newton discovered gravity. No, he didn't. We always knew things fell down, but we didn't, call, we didn't know it was the same thing that kept the um, pl planets orbiting around the sun and the moon orbiting around Earth. So, what Newton did was to say that actually all masses experience gravity. So, it's the same reason why the apple falls as it is why we are orbiting around the sun. 
Amazing, right? So he stated basically that the force was proportional to the product of two masses over the radius or the distance between them squared. So he was able to calculate that um, quite precisely, okay? Um, he was able to calculate that and show that actually it was an inverse square law and it was proportional to the product of the two masses. So it didn't just depend on one mass, that force, it depended on both masses. Um, I think it was Cavendish who came in and put a big G on it, so he was a big G. He had big, basically iron, um, big lead balls maybe actually, okay, um, in this kind of cathedral sized experiment, massive experiment. He worked out the law, uh, he worked out the constant of universal gravitation, which we call big G. So essentially if we've got a proportionality, we can calculate a, a constant by measuring it really, really carefully. And obviously we've subsequently um, done more experiments and measured again. Now Kepler 1, 2 and 3, I've written them down here, but I can never remember them, so your homework is finding them. I did talk through Kepler's laws in a previous live feed. I can't remember which one. They don't come up on Edexcel though, so that's why I'm not, the, um, I'm not completely au fait with them, and I don't want to get it wrong for you right now. Cosmological principle is a really important thing. It's not an Excel, but I thought I'd bring it in here, okay? Um, it basically allows us to actually think about the universe because we can't go ahead and do what we normally do, which would be make experiments, do control kind of studies, right? So we have to kind of model the universe as being generally homogeneous. So generally it's got the same density. Generally it's got a uniform density. When we look at a large area of it, a large volume of it, not just a small kind of little, you know, any this bit here, it's not the same density as a black hole, for example. So large volumes, um, same density. Now isotropic means there's no kind of special direction, okay? So if we measure something from any direction, we get the same value. So if you think about my pen, it doesn't matter which way I measure it, okay? I'm always gonna get the same dimensions of my pen. It's not different because it's moving in a certain direction. It's not different if I look at it from a different direction. So isotropic, the universe has no special direction. Every direction we do, um, we measure, we get the same things, and all of these laws of physics are universal. So that's a really important cosmological principle, that actually the laws of physics here on Earth are the same on any other kind of great big body in space, uh, any other part of the universe. Now, we don't know that for sure, but without stating that, we can't really model how the universe works. So it's an important principle on which to base our study of the universe. Coulomb's law relates the force and um, the two charges. Again, it's proportional between the product of charges over the distance squared. So it's an inverse square law again. Okay, um, And they often use a comparison of different types of fields. So if you can see Newton's law of gravitation and Coulomb's law look pretty similar. They act on different things though, don't they? There's interesting things though, because mass is scalar, Newton's law always has an attractive force, whereas the, um, the signs of these two charges tell us whether it's attractive. So if they're opposite charge, then it will be an attractive force. If they're uh, the same charge, then it'll be a positive number. So it will be an away force, it'll be a repelling force. Okay, so there's really interesting stuff there. Thermodynamics one is perhaps the most important universe, um, universal law. Okay, so all things in a closed system tend towards entropy. So basically, this law states that energy can't be created or destroyed. It's just being transferred to, from form to form or place to place. But it, as it does so, then it's spreading out in the form of heat. So energy dissipates. That's the way I like to state it. Um, through heating. So dissipates means that it's, it's uh, spreading out, becoming too small to use, and it's heating. So eventually, every single thing in the universe is going to become um, is going to reach thermal equilibrium. At least that's what the law of thermodynamics says. Or who knows when we discover what dark matter is all about? Whether this law will, in fact be the same everywhere in every single place. But it's an important law for now, and it certainly works every experiment we've been able to do. Thermodynamics 2 states that um, heat moves from hot to cold, but importantly, the rate of heat transfer is proportional to a temperature difference. So I don't have to uh, state that really. So dq over dt, the rate of heat transfer, is proportional to a difference in temperature. 
that seems to work for me. I hope that makes sense to you. So the bigger the difference in temperature, the faster the heat is transferred between two places. Boyle's law is inverse proportionality between pressure and volume. Charles' law is um, that's uh, proportionality between temperature and volume. Okay, and this is the one that gives us absolute zero. And I did this in the previous video. Gay Lussac law again um, proportional, and you get absolute zero. But this time between pressure. We often call it the pressure law and temperature, and this being absolute zero here. And the ideal gas law is the combination of those. So if I got uh, V P equals a constant, V over T equals a constant, P over T equals a constant, then it's the same as saying V P over T equals a constant. Okay, and that's the ideal gas law. And what is that constant? Well, it's N R or it is NK, uh, sorry, I rewind myself, okay, NR, NK, capital N, which is number of molecules times by the stefan boltzmann constant, or it is the number of moles times by the molecular gas constant. So this is, either one of these can be used as this K, know which one your spec uses. Okay, a few more little bits then here. So power laws versus exponential laws. So a power law is something like um, the Stefan Boltzmann law, where y is equal or proportional to x raised to a given power. Now to get this into a straight line, you plot a log log graph. So they often give you a unknown uh, law or rule that they've kind of made up. A student is investigating this bit of algebra here. Here's the results for them. Plot a graph to get a straight line, basically use it to determine a constant. Okay, so you need to remember to log both of your axes to get a straight line and use that gradient to figure something else out in that within that algebra. Exponential laws follow the form uh, y equals y naught e to the power of some constant x. Now, um, this is a decay law because I've got a minus thing, but it, basically the x variable is the exponent rather than the x variable is the thing being raised to a power. And this time you plot a log graph. It means you just log the y variable. Okay? If you log out both sides, then that's when you get y equals mx plus c. So these really, these are examples of decay laws. So essentially this this type of question here, make sure you just spot whether it's a log log graph because it's a power law, x is raised to a power, or it's an exponential law where x is the power and you plot a log graph in this case. Now, decay law is when you've got a, a negative um, exponent of E, or it doesn't even have to be E, it could be any number at all, and you still get the same kind of rules, you still plot a log graph. And the inverse square law is when Y is proportional to one over X squared, okay? So uh, we've talked about these quite a lot. And then there's just um, Einstein's law of special rel relativity, which comes in a little bit at, uh, at Excel where they're talking really just about you need to know that when things approach the speed of light their mass increases so you can give them more energy but their speed doesn't necessarily increase very much at that point because of this extra mass okay and it t tends to be so you can recognize this it tends to be at speeds kind of greater than 0.7c where they start to talk about relativistic effects why spell that right um, so you can recognize that, but they normally tell you unrelativistic speeds or they tell you to ignore relativity, anything like that. Now this has two kind of, um, two, uh, I forgot what they're called here, two tenets okay, of these laws. The physical laws have the same form in all inertial frames. Now, so this is saying that the physical laws apply um, within a given inertial frame, not in every single, not the same in every single, uh, not the same across two inertial frames, but the same in any given one. And this also states that the speed of light is the only constant. Okay, so here's where e equals mc squared came from, okay, it being the constant of conversion of mass into energy. So again, you just need a little bit of relativity, although there is a whole option about relativity, I think, in OCI. I'll just say as well, be prepared to do derivations. And I did a um, derivation video where I went through loads of different derivations. And I've already seen there's been one on paper one at Excel and one on paper two at Excel. Really quite tricky ones. Well, actually, the paper two one was easier than the paper one one. But be prepared to do derivations in this paper that is coming up now.
So um, that's it, basically that's my wrap. I just want to say one more thing that I don't think I made clear enough at the start, which was about uh, synoptic questions. So synoptic questions tend to be the hardest ones because they use different parts of the syllabus to solve the same problem. Okay, so you need to be really kind of up on all of this kind of stuff that you've got, all of these tools, that you've got all of this in your arsenal to solve those problems. You need to know exactly how to use them because a synoptic question is going to ask you to use one part of the syllabus to solve the first part of the problem and another part of the syllabus to solve another one. There are some common ones, like I said, um, electrical magnetic fields and circular motion is a really common one. Comparison of different fields is a really common one. Okay, but there is essentially an infinite kind of variety of different things that they could bring in from different uh, parts of the spec to really test, really probe your knowledge and understanding. So just be resilient, be prepared, pause and really, really think about it. I haven't talked about the practical stuff, but that's because th there's my practical feed, which I'm pretty sure I put in the description. Okay, um, da -da 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 decoding the six markers. Maybe, maybe I haven't put it in this one, but if you just go back to my recent videos, you just go for yeah, earlier live feeds. Every practical, yeah, from LXL A level physics. So there's, that's there in the description for you. Um, also, I have a playlist, exam playlist for paper free for LXL. So go ahead and hit that one up as well. It should be really, really useful. And now I'll just spend a bit of time hanging out with you. I've not got long though, because it's, it's dinner time for us here. <laughs> and um, it's time that I kind of had a bit of, I don't know if you can tell from my voice, I'm a little bit ill at the minute as well. So it's not, it's not really going well for me. Where's the chat one? There it is. Okay, um, here's the... Uh, oh, I'll give you the quiet one. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm just going to rewind back to the chat. It doesn't rewind the thing, but you can you can chat about it. it seems to have been some useful chat. I don't know how many people will be listening to me, but hopefully uh, hopefully there were some good things in there. I'm not going to go through all of this. I might have a little look through this later. Um, yeah, the one thing I did want to say, though, is tell me what you want me to go through um, on Wednesday. Okay, I don't know whether it's um, I don't know whether it's it's kind of worth me really focusing on content. Okay, when there's so much good YouTube content out there, like me give, giving my visualizer go over it, might not be the most useful thing, but maybe it's some general things. I want to kind of look at some typical examples from um, Edexcel paper free, so it might be useful. You're talking about the Edexcel lens diagram. Yeah. It, I, <sighs> To be honest, those ones are quite easy if you've learnt the kind of rules well enough. But I, I know you get confused, don't you, with the positive and negative views. Those people saying that my live feed is about the, the um, practicals were really useful. Yeah, I thought the first one was worse than the second one, I must admit. Yeah, paper one was hard. Yeah, the centripetal one was hard. I've talked about that in the in the previous video. So I'm not going to go into that one now. Yeah, Newton's laws from M one to M three in maths. Interesting. I think they're they're the type of thing that once you've done loads of questions on them, then you start to get it your head around. But Newton's laws is something so interesting. Like you teach them the first time you teach them, and and you really. Um, we didn't get them very well and actually like every single year I get a deeper and deeper understanding of Newton's laws that's why I think we care so much about the laws in um, in physics is because they can be applied to solve so many different problems and you just think oh yeah Coulomb's law oh yeah just Snell's law isn't it you know there's so many times where it's just like that like that in physics so so do get your head around those laws spend the time and say this was just not an in-depth one spend your time go back through this video if you like and look at all those laws and make sure that you're fluent in them make sure that you're ready to do that any other good chat when's maths is it is it tomorrow or anything like that Who is Stoke? <laughs> Unnecessary Stoke bashing, there. 
Oh, Stokes Law. Yes, it only works for small solid spheres. Yeah, only laminar flow. <laughs> yeah, don't don't spend a lot of time decoding the last questions because the, the last um, the last papers because they're gone now. It, although I suppose it's kind of um, reassuring to hear that other people struggled on the same paper as you did. Okay, yeah, I've got to go as well, Mariam. Yeah, so I hope it was useful. Oh, Chem's tomorrow, is it? Okay, good luck with Chem then. Yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, so they make you do like all the physics in the last one, but it, it's kind of a bit more specific than all of the physics because it is, it's about using a deep knowledge of it, isn't it? Yeah, if you're too tired to rise, Mariam, then you probably just need to sleep, mate. Yeah, get yourself a rest before iftar. Out. When's iftar tonight? Or is that that's finished with now, is it? No, it's still a few more days, I think. Boils always pressure and volume crypto. I don't believe anyone's put him right on that one. Yeah, I wouldn't spend your time doing too much predictions, although definitely think about what did and didn't come up in the last two. Experiments don't make it harder necessarily, especially if you learn them in detail. That's why I'm, I keep saying about this um, experiments feed. Go ahead and find it. Even if you just go ahead and skip through it and think, do you know it, do you know it, do you know it? Okay. So was that helpful then? Um, I hope we just set a source of memes. This is not turning into meme review, okay? It's not happening. There's been no bonus meme in this place. Three to four days of Ramadan remaining. Thanks, Josh. Worked on it. Okay, that's been me. That's my chat. I hope it was useful. Let me know. Let me know things that you want for next time. Remember, GCSE folks, I'll be doing some stuff um, on Wednesday and Thursday as well. You guys are finished on Thursday. Maybe that's the end of your A-levels. But I want you to stick around, stick around, go on, stick around at least until results day because I really want to know how well you've done. Okay, I really want to know as well after this paper what your experience will be of that as well. All right, so um, do stick around and I'll be doing more things in uh, the next academic year and it'd be lovely to see how you guys are all doing. All right, thanks, Adam. Yet, see you all later. Eid's on Friday. Well, I'll be, you know, I'll be excited for that for you guys as well.